Bishop for Christ Health Ministries International. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm sorry we've started a little bit later than usual because um, of issues that are kind of beyond our own control. But we want to thank God that he has given us the opportunity to come live to you. And indeed we are. We are live right now. So get your friends on board and uh, we see what we have to share today. Today we are going to begin on a new series which is called Manifactor. I want to teach a certain truth that I've discovered in the Word of God and some of the things that I strongly believe have to happen if the church is to go forward and the church is to also be uh, in the position where it dominates the world. So get your friends here and uh, we, 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 we get on with the, with the gospel the way we, oops, the way we have purpose to, to have it. So get your friends around and uh, we, we, we launch it off. Uh, for those of you joining us on Facebook, we welcome you today. We're not going to use, uh, uh, we're not going to use um, Dachita, what, yeah? we're not going to use uh, Zoom because Zoom has been giving us uh, problems but we're going to be using uh, Facebook. So get your friends here and then we see uh, what God has, has in store for us. Um, in just a few seconds, I'm gonna be starting. So that's why I'm giving you just a few minutes to, to be able to get your friends on board. We are gonna be talking about money, not offerings, but money not offerings. You're not going to be talking about offerings. You're going to be talking about money. Mm. Are we ready to start? I'm sorry, I need to still adjust uh, this camera because I'm not so happy with, with the way it's functioning. I'm almost there. Pray for me to get working things because these ones are for improvisation. I don't know. Everything you buy just dies in minutes. I'm not so happy with that. Okay. You bear with me. I don't like I don't like it, but kind of that's kind of the best that uh, I can probably afford for today. Mm -hmm. It's not where I'm facing, it's, it's the camera, yeah? yeah? Right, okay, let's go with that. Let's go with that, forgive me for that. Uh, we are trying to make this better. So manufacturer, this is manufacturer number one. We are going to be having several uh, things. Thank you, wife. Uh, could you help me move this light a little bit closer to my eyes? Because there is a way I want to see myself in this light. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Money factor number one. Money factor number one. Um, you have also noticed that uh, increasingly when we, we as Christians want to engage in businesses, we find ourselves uh, caught in a very difficult position. Um, there are very few Christians who make it to the top of um, a worldly system or in the world. Very few Christians make it. In fact, I've discovered that the road for a Christian to succeed, born again Christian to succeed, they work twice as hard as people who are Streetwise, it's very difficult. But also, the biggest problem that we find in the body of Christ is the situation where we keep pointing people to going to heaven. When people are more prone to going to heaven, then they quickly give up things that would have improved them. And uh, we, we, we also seem to get tired very quickly and we seem to be, we seem to get, uh, overcome very easily, which is not a, a good trait for a believer. But today I want to deal with the issue of money. 
So where should money be in the life of a believer? A believer is supposed to be rich. Is it okay for a believer to be rich? Is it okay for a believer to have money? Hmm? When we wake up in the morning and we go to pursue money, is that okay? Is it okay if we pursue money or we are just supposed to pursue God? Can we go? Let's begin. Uh, let's begin with uh, Matthew. Um, give me my give me my Bible. Matthew chapter six. Uh, yes, Matthew, Matthew chapter six. The Bible says, uh, verse twenty four, that you cannot serve both God and Mammon. It doesn't say you can't have. The Bible does not say, it doesn't say. It says verse 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, in the entire scripture, you cannot find a comparison between God and Satan. It doesn't exist. But you will find a comparison between God and money. There's no comparison between God and Satan. But there is a comparison between God and money. And the only thing that will compete with God is actually money. That's what scripture says. Scripture says you cannot it's not possible. The opposite ends of a continuum, on one side there is God, on another side there is money. On one side you have God, on one side you have money. You cannot serve these two people. You cannot. You cannot be in the light and at the same time you are in darkness. You cannot be wet and at the same time dry. These are opposites. So, does the Bible mean that we are not supposed to be rich? That's not what it says. The Bible says, thank you, the Bible says that we cannot serve. Why? Because according to Matthew chapter 6, God is a master and also Mammon is a master. God is a master. Mammon is also a master. So the Bible is saying in 6 verse 24, no one, no one can serve. Dulio, the Greek word, serve. No, no one can serve. It, there has not been a man that has served or can serve both God and money at the same time. And by service we mean to submit, to yield obedience, to become a slave to, to be in bondage to, to do service to, it is not possible. It is not possible for a man to serve God and also serve money. Luke renders it a little bit differently in Luke chapter 16. And I want us to read these verses because they, 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 they are going to make a difference in how we are perceiving money. Am I saying don't work? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. But at the same time, I'm not saying that your ultimate persuasion or pursuit should be money. In Luke chapter 16 and uh, verse 13, uh -huh. this is what the Bible says. Thank you. No worker. The other verse was saying no one. This one is saying, verse 13, no worker huh? can serve two bosses. He'll either hate the first and love the second or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God 
and the bank. Now, the KJV says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. It's a principle. You cannot serve both God and man. And he says, he'll either hate one, love the other, despise one, hold on to the other. It is impossible for a man to serve both God and money. Serve. Fronero. Hmm? I mean, despise is that word fronero, which is having an opinion of oneself. Catafronero, which we, <laughs> catafronero means to think little or nothing of. So if you love God, you think little or nothing of money. If you love money, you think little or nothing of God. Cata fronero. Cata, which means looking down to fronero is opinion. So cata fronero is a situation where a person, in their opinion, belittles another because of the choice they have made. If you choose God, you will automatically belittle Mammon. If you choose Mammon, you will be little God. Hallelujah. Now this is complex. Am I saying you shouldn't work? No. Am I saying that you shouldn't be rich? No. But these riches should have a place. And also God should have a place in your life. You see, when you look in the first, in the first chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 53, uh, there's a prophecy there which is being given uh, by uh, Zachariah's prophecy. Yeah? No, that's not Zachariah's prophecy. Mary's song. Mary's song in verse 53, chapter 1, verse 53, it says that he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has sent the rich away empty. So that means there is a place where the rich and the def his definition of rich is very different from our definition of rich. Hmm? So Jesus is, has just been born, but Mary is prophesying. She is prophesying. So the thing is, can a person be a full-time believer and a full-time spiritual person and they operate successfully in a worldly system using worldly systems and processes? The answer is no. Because when you become a Christian, every part of you becomes owned by God. And the world system, as much as you are in the world, you are not of it. So that means the nature with which you function from the moment you become born again, your nature is antagonistic to the world and the world system is antagonistic to you. That's why things like persecution come in. Have you ever had a Christian country? Have you ever had a Christian country persecuting non-believers? The answer is no. Have you ever had a Christian refusing to employ non-believers? No. Have you ever had a Christian refusing to, 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 to employ Muslims? No. But when, when, a, when a Christian goes to work for a Muslim, it's easy they can refuse. Why? Because these are two different systems. This is about systems. You can go to a certain area and they tell you you cannot sell land to Christians. And that's it. You can't buy it. Even if you bought it, you can't live there. But there's no place where we say this place is strictly for Christians. Why? Because Christians basically are operating under a different system. There's no law which tells you that if someone steals, there's no religion which says if someone steals from you, let them go free with your stuff. In some religions, they say, cut off the hand. The Christian, the Bible says, if someone is stealing your coat, give them the tunic. But these are hard things. 
Stealing. You want me to continue? This is the word. Okay, so can a Christian operate in a worldless system? Or is the worldless system controlled by God? No. God is not controlling the worldless system. God can only dominate or control the world, worldless system if he has enough enough Christians, en enough people who have him in him in the world. Today the world has a system and this system has its own language, its own jargon, its own patterns, its own rewarding system. If you're going to say, ah, for me, I'm going to do things correctly, you will be sidelined. I know so many people who have lost contracts, big contracts, because they refuse to give kickback. Because for them, they believe kickback is sin. I know people who are lagging behind because, because they are unwilling to pay a bribe or to tell a lie. I was, I was interviewing a certain uh, a dear Christian lady. She's an importer of fabric. And she was telling me uh, how, how it is difficult to compete with people on, uh, with people on her street. They couldn't compete with the people on her street. And I asked her, why can't you compete with the people on your street? And she said, well, the people on our street there is a way they do business, and that's not how we do business. Now, the Christian lady, the way she does her business is, is different. Hmm? She tells the truth. <laughs> she tells the truth because that's what she knows. And the other guys, they can tell a lie. So you can't compete when you, if you bought the machine at 10 million and you're told to tell the truth, that means you're going to tell them 10 million. Hmm? You're, going to, you're going to tell them 10 million shillings. That's, and then they'll tax you based on 10 million shillings. You get it? Eh? Eh? The non believer is free not to tell the truth because it's not bound by the law of God. They know the law of God, but they will say, this is the world. I know so many people, so many girls who have been made to repeat a year because the lecturer said, I have to sleep with you to give you marks. And when the lecturer says to you, I want to sleep with you to give you, to give you marks, and then you say, no, I don't want, then the lecturer will fail you. And because you are Morally straight, you will be made to repeat a yap. We hear of those stories all the time. They are there. So, should we be godly and also engage in business? The answer is yes, we should. But on what rules and uh, uh, whatever are, are we supposed to operate? Hmm? What are, how are we supposed to how are we supposed to operate? Hmm? I'm, I'm reading some comments here. How are we supposed to operate? The fact that the system we are discussing is called worldly worldly system it means it's not God's system. It is owned by somebody else. That's why you see, even when you're going to drink, even when you go to a bar, a person will tell you, let us drink for these are worldly things. Haven't you heard that? Let's dance. These are worldly things. Let's go and enjoy life for these are worldly things which means they, they have an origin. 
They have their origin. They have their source and they have their boss. Hmm? So when the system is called worldly, when the system is called worldly, it is working in the world. And whatever is working in the world is not necessarily God's. So if you are going to, 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 to operate in the world or to operate in anything, let's say anything, let's begin there. In anything you want to operate from, the first question you need to ask yourself, what's going to be my source of motivation? Is it going to be God? Is it going to be the world? Because there are only two. Two. You cannot say, I'm, 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 I'm going to be half God, half world. No. You have to decide from the very start what, what your motivation is going to be. And this is very, very important. Very, very important. You want to run a business. You want to run a relationship. How are you going to run this relationship? Are you going to run it as a godly relationship or are you going to run it as a worldly relationship? The, the terms are very different. Hmm? You want to run a ministry. Are the things you're looking at really God's things or you're looking at things which which are not God's things. It's possible that someone is running God's business but is using the world's approach. Are you with me? It is possible that the stuff you're doing is meant to be spiritual, but the means you're using are canon. So is God pleased? No. Can he put up with it? Not necessarily. Can we proceed? So when we go to First John, chapter 2, in verse 15. I'm going to get a few a few friends and uh, some enemies, I know. First John. Okay? This is amplified. Uh, it says, eh? uh, 15. The Bible says, do not cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. You remember where we've started? We've started with obeying, loving God and loving mammon. Now, John is telling us if a person loves the world, and the world system runs on mammon, the love of the Father is not in them. Are you with me? For all that is in the world, there are only three things in the world. Everything in the world can be placed under three classes of things. Three classifications. Number one, the last of the flesh. The, the, in brackets, craving for sensual gratification. Number two, the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. Pride of life. When you build a house, you begin walking around telling people, me, I finished building. I am settled. You've heard that word. I am settled. Why? Because I have a house. Until city council comes with their uh, funny graders, and then they tell you, you built in a road. Huh? Or until someone comes and claims the land and then raises down your house on the ground. 
We think that the moment we get money, the most important thing we need to work on is to get a piece of land and to build. And once you build, they call you settled. He's settled. What do you mean by settled? He has built a house. But these are the three things which are in the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the assurance in one's own resources and stability. Now that you've got a job, now you can rest and begin to put on weight. Pride of life. Now that you're married, you can now step back. Hmm? Now that you're married, madam, you can't greet anymore because you are, you're married. Pride of life. Now that you've got a job and they've made you a manager or a middle manager or a supervisor, now, now you can't greet. Now you can also begin arriving at nine o'clock and order people around because you had a bad day. Pride of life. You buy a new car and you want to break traffic rules. Pride of life. They lend you a car and you're racing it to show of pride of life. You're seated in a taxi and you're pulling out your phone. You're not calling anybody. You're making random calls just because you want to impress people in the taxi that you have a very expensive phone. Pride of life. The Bible says, if anyone is operating with the, with the world, with the love of the world, if a person loves these three things, then the love of the Father is not present in them. If you are persuaded, driven, motivated, and overtaken by the things I've mentioned above, then it is clear the love of the Father is not in you. Are you with me? So, what is this love of the Father? Of course, the things, if, if, you, if you keep looking at, uh, at, at those things which we are looking at today, These things written in verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the craving of sensual gratification, these things are enjoyable for a minute or for, for a season. Lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, they are enjoyable. Pride of life, it is enjoyable. And the Bible tells us that the characteristics of these things in verse 17, it says, and the world passes away. Hmm? and disappears with it the forbidden cravings the lust the passionate desires the lust of it but he who does the will of god and carries out his purposes in his life abides forever are you with me can we proceed so, amongst, when you read Romans chapter 8, from verse 35, 35 asks a question and says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And now, they're, they're, they're showing the things that attack the Christian to try and make their work difficult. And says, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, Famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So the question I want to ask you, do you realize that most of these things that are supposed to make our lives difficult are actually uh, bad things? But the Bible says that even the bad things will not be able to separate us. And the Bible says, Father says, that we are more than conquerors, not we are more than fighters. It doesn't say that we are more than fighters. 
Hmm? It doesn't say that we are more than fighters. So those of you who are warmongers, this is not your place. This is not your place. This is not a place where we fight. Hmm? So how are we going to operate in the kingdom of God in this particular time? Number one, I've been asking a question. Is it okay to have money? Yeah. But it's not okay for money to have you. What do you mean? By being submitted to it, serving it, and make you do anything. There are people who money will make do anything. It can make you lie. It can make you give a false testimony. It can make you hate somebody. It can even make you kill. The answer is, it has you. That money has you. So it's okay to have money, but it's not okay for money to have you. Number two, the system of the world works with the flesh. And the mind with which it functions is the opposite of the mind of God. When you read Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, you will realize what I'm telling you. Romans 8, 7, this is what it says. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be so. Then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're going to be if you are going to be if you are going to be motivated by the world it's not possible you're not going to be you're not going to be motivated by god because what motivates you towards god is opposite of what motivates you to the world. Hmm. Number three, it is therefore wrong to bring the worldly system of operation and try to operate it in the church. It is wrong. The world has its system. And the system of the world cannot function in the church. It can't. And it should not. It shouldn't. Because the church is an extension to the kingdom of God. Which kingdom of God is invisible? The world is also a representation of an invisible kingdom. Now, let me put this right. The church is a representation of the invisible kingdom of God. The world is an invisible, is a visible representation of the invisible kingdom of Satan. The world system. So when you are as a believer are placed into the world, you are in the world, but not of it, which means that you are reporting to a different kingdom. You are, you are having a different constitution and the rules by which you live are different. And by virtue of those few three things, you're going to find yourself at loggerheads most of the time with the system of the world.
it is wrong for you to seek to be understood by the world. Because at the end of the day, the system of the world will succumb to the system of God. That's how it's going to end. Right now, it is not so. But please, we carry three major scriptures. One is in Isaiah chapter 9. The Bible tells us that the, that the, the government shall be upon the shoulders of the Messiah. The government, the rulership of the world, the governance of the world shall be operating from the shoulders of the Messiah, not from Satan. So in a short while, you're going to see a flip. A second scripture is in Revelation. It says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So this entire system of the world, as you see it, is about to succumb to the authority of God. It's in the process. And the Bible says, still in the book of Isaiah, that a time is coming when the world shall be filled with the glory of God. It shall be filled with the glory of God. It shall be filled with the glory of God. So, the kingdom of God is supposed to take over and dominate the system of the world. But the system of God cannot take over the system of the world if the people who are supposed to operate in the kingdom of God are not fully aware of their rules, of, of their rights and privileges, and, and all the actions that are supposed to be carried out in, the, in, 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 in that kind of thing. It is self-defeating for us to say, we are bringing the kingdom of God down and we, we are going to cause the kingdom of God to dominate the kingdom of this world and take over. And yet we who are operating in the kingdom of God are not fully convinced of the kingdom of God and the practices in the kingdom. And when we talk about money, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we need to talk about money. Because the first thing the kingdom has or requires are resources. Once the resources are in place, then anything else is possible. Hallelujah. So, so what do we do with the kingdom of God? Let me take you to, back to Matthew chapter 22. There is a story there which is quite interesting. We'll begin in verse, I think, uh, 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. What a, what a good conclusion about Christ. What a conclusion about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not about pleasing people. You want to operate in the kingdom of God, you have to do away with pleasing people. You have to. So tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. Now, <laughs> now, now you think about it. Was this response of Jesus, you know, even these guys knew. They knew from extrapolation 
I'm putting one and two together, that Jesus was introducing another kingdom with a different kind of rulership and with a different kind of rules and regulations. So they come and they ask him, should we stop paying taxes? And Jesus says to them, in verse 21, render, render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Render, apodidomai, Deliver, give away for one's profit what is one's own. Give away to your own profit to Caesar. What belongs to Caesar? Why? Because when you give it, they will not arrest you. You understand? And also give to God his bit. Render to God his bit render to Caesar his bit. Hmm? Render to God his bit, render to Caesar his bit. You need to understand, you already know, by the way, that spiritual things are invisible in most cases, but worldly things are seen. So it is easy for, for you to have two brothers in a home one is spiritual and one is worldly. And the one is, who is worldly is showing you things and the progresses. And you're looking at one who is spiritual and you're looking like this guy, Yatu Salah. But what does the Bible say about spiritual things? They are invisible yet permanent. What does the Bible say about worldly things? They are visible yet temporal. The scripture we've already read already says that those who are led by the spirit, they will live forever. If you are led by the flesh, you cannot come under God's, God's wisdom, God's instruction. Therefore, if you can't come under his instruction, you can't also come under his protection. Can I continue and finish? Because I'm left with uh, basically 11 minutes. In Luke chapter 10, so, so Jesus is saying, you give to Caesar what belongs to him and give to God what belongs to him. So whatever God requires of you as a believer, do. Whatever the government requires of you as, as, as a citizen of a certain country, do. But the government is a subject to God. But God is not subject to the government. We, we have a whole week. We have a whole week where we're going to be working on um, this subject of money. But let's, let, let, me, let me give you just one more, one more scripture and then we're going to end there. Luke chapter 10 is a very interesting. Luke chapter 10. Now this is a story about Mary and Martha. Luke chapter 10. The Bible says in verse 40, but Martha... No, verse 39. And Mary, uh, Martha received him into her house, but and her sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet, had his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, does thou care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore to help me. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part. That good part. That good part, which shall not be 
taken away from her. She has been wise in her selection. She has picked the part which cannot be taken away from her. She has picked a part which cannot be taken away from her. So I want to find out from you. Is the part that you have chosen able to stay with you? Is it able to stay with you? Have you chosen the good part? Hmm? Have you chosen the good part which cannot be taken away from you? Hmm? Have you chosen the good part? What is money to you? And what is money for? Yes, you have money in your account. Yes, you have money on your phone. What is that money for you? For? To you. Is it an end? Is it a means? Is it a point of access? Is it a means of transaction? Is it status? What is money for? What is it for? And Jesus says that Mary has chosen the part the good part, the good part that cannot be taken away from her. She has chosen the good part. Which part did she choose? To sit at the feet. That's the part she chose. She chose the part of sitting at the feet. It's a part. Hmm? It's a part. Every day we make choices. But it is madness for you to choose a choice whose end you know. And you keep believing that it's going to turn out differently. I meet ladies almost every day who tell me, oh, I've met this guy. He loves me so much, blah, 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 blah. And then I say, where does he pray from? Uh, he's a good Christian. Is he a believer? He's a good Christian. He loves God. But he's not a believer. I will pray for him to change. It's deception. If you ever marry someone, you've preached to and converted, you will be regretting in a short while. Anyway, Mary chose the good part and a part that cannot be taken away from her. That's the part of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Does God really need your money? The answer is no. God can accomplish his things by making even people to work for free or people to give you for free what money, what would have cost money to buy, for you to buy anything. It's possible. But because we are living with in, a, in, in a broken world, even our spirituality is broken. It is broken. That even we who work in the kingdom of God, we don't want to fulfill all the tenets regarding money in the kingdom. 
For instance, we are not supposed to work on Sunday. We are supposed to get a day in the week and rest. Do we rest? No. Every seventh year, we are supposed to leave the land to follow for one year. Do we do that? No. We are supposed to give alms to the widows, to the strangers, and to the orphans. Do we do that? No. If we do it, we bring cameras. You simply are, are going around giving beans. Five kilograms of beans, each kilo of beans is 500 shillings. So 3,000 shillings and three kilograms of beans, which is about uh, five kilograms of beans, which is about, uh, let's say, 9,000. So for 15,000, you're giving food to a desperate person and you bring a camera to take a picture of you giving out 15,000 shillings worth of food. What are you looking for? Human praise. Where does that come from? From the world. Is the love of Father in it? No. Because the Bible says when you're giving anything to any man with the right hand, don't even let the left to know. Both are your hands. But you shouldn't get money from your pocket with the left hand and then give it to, the, put it in the right hand to give it away. The same way you get it out of the pocket is the same way you should hand it over. Now, if both of your hands are not supposed to carry a witness that they gave, how much more should we not tell people? But at the same time, we don't have to tell them, but we are telling them just because we are looking for cheap popularity. See, Joe? So the kingdom of God has its own money system and its own money procedure. And if you are going to operate in it, we should obey the financial principles. Do they work overnight? Most probably they don't. Do they work in the long run? Yes. Can I be assured that God will come through for me? God will come through regardless. But if you don't have any blemish, you stand in the different league of people. Hallelujah. So we're going to stop there. I've just started talking about money. Money is a tool. Not a weapon. It can be a weapon. Some people use it to win wives. If you're having a, an issue with another guy, uh, all you do is you just bring money out and prove that you are actually the best or the richest. But that's not the way we need to be using God's money. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. It's been nice to have you. We will meet again tomorrow as we continue to talk about money. God bless.